Hi, everybody. Welcome to Discover College Soccer. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Coach Trace Leone from Colby up in Maine. Welcome, Coach. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, excited to talk to to, to really uh, kind of one of the, the, the legends in the U.S. in college soccer coaching ranks and playing ranks. Uh, you know, uh, really happy to have you. So you just were uh, announced as the head coach there in April. So haven't been at the helm too long, and I guess you're probably, well, I don't know, did you guys start preseason yet, or are you getting ready to? Well, the, the players report on the 23rd of August, and then we start training the 25th. Okay, so you, you got a couple weeks, but uh, so I'm glad we're catching you before you get in the thick of it. Um, well, so let's talk a little bit about recruiting. You know, I, I mean, you, you kind of had a late start, but uh, generally speaking, you know, when is it that you're liking to – to talk to to start talking to players to really start that recruitment process. What year in high school to to the kids usually are? Yeah, well, with Division three, the rules are a little bit different than the other divisions. So we can actually email players very early and start our communications with them. And so um, if we see a player that we like at an event, um, then then we'll let them know and kind of introduce ourselves and introduce Colby to them and kind of begin the process in that way, um, you know, with phone calls and, um, you know, more intensive visits and things like that. Typically, like, we'll, we've been on the phone now already with 2024s, but in terms of probably visiting, it will start probably this fall and kind of throughout the next year. Um, and then, you know, the beginning of, of July, we're able to hear more about their academic profile and, um, a little bit where they stand, um, at least at that point, um, through the admissions process. And although, of course, nothing is guaranteed, we kind of get a little bit of a snapshot of, of where they are and, and we'll then start to really try and finalize the class uh, through the summertime. Sure. Well, you mentioned events. Uh, you know, you guys have a pretty diverse roster in terms of geography. Uh, which, you know, is, is different from, from maybe a lot of D3s who are more regionally focused. So what are some of the events that are on your kind of must-see list or, or places, you know, places that you're going to make sure you go to uh, for, for seeing players? Well, you know, of course, the season, you're so busy with your team that sure. the evaluation time really is, is very limited, if at all, because you're so focused on the team. Of course, you're always recruiting. <laughs> you're always <laughs> right making calls and people coming to campus. And, you know, we have prospect clinics even in the fall. So we have prospect clinics all throughout the year. Um, and that's helpful because players can come to the campus, get to know Colby, get a campus tour, get a lot of questions answered and meet some of the current players and also get to know us. And then we in turn get to know them and get a chance to train them and, and watch them play. And so it's really a great experience, I think, all the way around for, for both parties, these prospect clinics. So we'll have a lot of those throughout the year. But after the season, we will really look to get at, you know, GA events, um, DPL events, and ECNL events. So we'll try and spread across all three leagues, um, you know, to try and, and, and search for the next Colby players. So um, we'll kind of spread across all three and Kind of look at our budget and see what we're able to do. Um, and, you know, if one of us will go or, or both Aaron and I, my assistant, will go and, you know, kind of go from there. So that'll pick up probably starting in December. Okay. It's funny you you, you mentioned DPL because I actually just had a parent write in and say, hey, can you start asking coaches, you know, where they see DPL and the, the USYS what is that? The E64 they have now going on, just all the all, all the alphabet soup of leagues. Um, you know, do you find that that really matters at all? What league players are in, or does that really just kind of guide your uh, which events you go to because of of the size and usually the quality of those events? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard. I think we only have so much time, <laughs> you know. Right. And I think that's what what people might not realize is they're just kind of thinking about their own family and their own, their own child. But, you know, we of course have our own families um, and want to spend time with them, but 
there's only so many events that we can go to due to time, sometimes due to budget. Um, and so we have to kind of pick and choose what are going to be the most beneficial to go to. Um, you know, the bigger tournaments are nice because you just see more players for the amount of money that you're spending and, and time that you're spending. Um, you know, right now the GA and the, and the ECNL are probably two of the more common events that most of the college coaches go to. Um, my daughter actually played in the DPL a few years ago. It was actually the NPL at the time, <laughs> um, but that changed, but it's basically the same league. And uh, we went to the national championships and there was like one coach there. And I was really surprised because uh, I thought, wow, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, you know, they're doing summer camps. They've been going to ECNL and GA events. I mean, there's like, again, there's only so many events that you can go to and you kind of have to pick and choose what, what works timing wise, budget wise, and, and uh, what you can get to. Yeah. And so I do like to go to the DPL events because I do think it's a, it's an underrated league. And I think, um, not as many people are attending those events. Um, and so that's why I kind of chose to go to one this summer and just kind of spread our umbrella a little bit wider than just the GA and the EC and the EC now. Yeah, no, I love it. Well, when you're at those events or if you're doing a prospect clinic or, or what have you, what is kind of your, your hierarchy of what you're looking at uh, at a player and that could be on the field attributes or, or off the field stuff. And I'm sure academics is a big part for, for you there, Colby. Yeah. I mean, it, it is nice to kind of have a snapshot of where they are academically with their, with their grades. And if they've taken the, the SAT or the ACT, you know, of course with COVID, a lot of schools, including Colby are test optional. And so you kind of are going through and navigating that process to see if they've taken the SAT or ACT and, and if those scores will actually help their academic profile and whether they should turn it in or whether they, should, whether they shouldn't because it is optional. And so that's kind of an added piece that COVID has brought to the admissions process. Um, you know, I think the clinics, what's nice about the clinics is you get to train them and you get to watch them actually train and kind of interact with them um, in terms of coaching them. Whereas at events, you're just literally watching from the sideline and then you're picking your chair up and going to the next game. And so you can tell a little bit more about them throughout the day, just because you have a little bit more time to spend with them. And, and again, watch them train, not just watch them play games. Um, you know, I think when I walk up to a field or even at our prospect clinics, the first things I kind of notice are more of the intrinsic qualities, you know, their work ethic, their competitive spirit, how they, they treat their teammates, their coaches, even their parents, um, the opponent even. Um, so really, I think that catches my eye initially because you're walking up to a field pretty much not really knowing anybody. And so, you know, those things are really important, I think, to, to every college coach and certainly are important to me. And so those catch my eye. Um, and then you're just looking at the, the technical, tactical and physical qualities of the players that you're watching. And I think the biggest thing in general is, and again, I think this would be helpful for players and players' parents to understand, is they have to make an impact in the game. There has to be something that separates them for them to be noticeable in the game. Um, and sometimes that's positional. So I might be like, I need a center back. I absolutely have to have a center back in this class. And so I will really target that position and really focus a lot of my attention on that position. And so sometimes it's just positional needs. And I was even explaining to a recruit just recently, even within that position, sometimes there's qualities that you need um, that are what they bring or might be different than what they bring. And what I mean by that is you might need a target forward who's great with their back to the to the game and such. And so if a player doesn't fit that, even though they're a really great forward, you might already have those qualities that they bring. And so you might be looking for even different qualities in specific positions that you're looking at. And positional needs do come into play in recruiting, um, you know, because you want to have a balanced team. And sometimes you might be looking for more left-sided players. You know, those are qualities. And so, you know, I think it's a simple process, but there are things that complicate it a little bit in terms of each needs of the program are going to be different. Um, but I look at this, certainly the, the athletic quality of the player 
and then certainly the technical foundation. I, I always believe tactically if they're really, really good, that's a huge bonus. I think there's oftentimes you can teach those throughout the time that they're in college, but um, it's nice to have a good tactical foundation as well. Okay. Now I know you've got, you know, a uh, great experience at, at several divisions of, of college soccer. So I'll kind of le lean into that as well as this. So one question I've been getting recently is, is around official visits. And I know uh, D1, D2 have limits as the number of schools, whereas D3 doesn't, but are official visits where the school is helping pay for travel, lodging, meals, and that sort of thing. Is that something that, that you find is very common at your level or do you just Colby do any of that? Well, you know, because I just got here, I'm going to be learning more about that. Right. I, there are more restrictions though, that our league and SCAC has on official visits. And uh, I don't think that they're going to be as common um, we can't pay for, for travel, for example, um, travel expenses. So yeah. I don't know if they're going to be as common as maybe they are at the division one level or what they've been in terms of my experience with them. Sure. But Northeastern, which was my most recent job before Colby, we pretty much only did official visits with, pe with people that were already committed to the school. Mm. The recruiting was done so early. And at that point in time, you could only offer official visits when they were seniors and you know the seniors had already made their mind up and so um obviously the rules have changed since and you can do it earlier but but with my experience that's when we did it we just did it with the players that were already you know committed to come um but again i think d3 and certainly the nescac league that that colby is in um you know have some more restrictions and certainly we have more budgetary restrictions as well sure um, and so we'll have to see how those play in really with what we're doing. I think the more common thing are unofficial visits. Yeah. And that's why with the prospect clinics, we're really trying to beef those up and make sure that they get a campus tour and we have a question and answer session and we have players, current players working the event so that when they leave, that can count as their visit and they feel like they've learned everything they need to know. Um, at the prospect clinic. And then of course the added bonus is we've been able to get to know them and see them play. Okay, great. Um, the one question on most people's minds, at least moms and dads is, uh, is about money and finances. Um, you know, no athletic scholarships there, but can you just give me a snapshot and I'm not holding you to hard numbers or anything like that, but just give me a snapshot of what the academic scholarship and other scholarship and financial aid picture uh, with tuition and everything, what's that look like for maybe a typical player coming into the Colby program? Yeah, and I, I understand all that because we, we I have a daughter right now who's going to be a sophomore <laughs> oh, wow. in college at UCLA. <laughs> so I understand all about the financial piece and what a challenge that is. Um, and of course, the cost of school is constantly going up and up and up and up. And so it's a challenge. I mean, it's certainly a piece that, that people have to consider. Um, with Colby, we don't have academic scholarships. Um, mm -hmm. I think the main reason for that is pretty much every student coming here is, you know, really, really, really strong. And so I'm not certain how you pick um, who deserves an academic scholarship over another, a little bit like the Ivies where, you know, they're all really, really top notch students. Um, Really with Colby, it's more about the, the need-based aid. And what's nice is we've got some really great um, financial aid packages um, that basically meet 100% of demonstrated need. And that's really great. So, you know, uh, student athletes or students will fill out the FAFSA, they'll fill out the CSS profile. That, that CSS profile is for institutional aid, need-based aid. And um, FAFSA, of course, is for the federal need-based aid, uh, loans and grants and such. And so, um, you know, Colby meets 100% of what's demonstrated in terms of what the family needs. Mm -hmm. There's also great tools online that, um, and that's, this is, isn't just at Colby, but I think everywhere now where there's a kind of a financial calculator and you can go on the admissions or financial aid website of an institution and kind of plug in some numbers and kind of get an estimate of, of what you might be looking at before turning in you know, all of the, the paperwork, um, which takes a bit of time, but it's, it's something now that is so important. And even some schools before you even apply, require you to complete 
the CSS profile in FAFSA, even if you kind of know you're not going to yeah. maybe fit those demands with need. And I think what's hard about the need too, and, and we're one of these families and there's millions of families out there that it says you can afford a certain amount, but you really feel like you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, what? Yeah. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think that's really the biggest challenge. And, and so, you know, um, students looking for outside scholarship help through the community. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for that. And I think, um, you know, families want to really get on that um, and try and see if their their son or daughter can apply for these outside scholarships and, and get some help that way as well. Yeah, no, make, that's good advice. And, and, and I feel like you, you, you were, you were looking into my soul with that. Uh, can I really afford that? <laughs> I mean, it's not like when you buy a house and, like, oh, yeah, right. and you're like, I can't afford that house. Are you crazy? Right, right. And so, you know, it, it's tricky. I mean, I think what's hard is, and I think it's amazing, like, you know, the packages that a school like Colby can put together for need-based aid. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all kind of know our families and know the financial demands and, and it's, it is a tricky process. Um, yeah, but for sure. I'm really happy to be at a school that really, you know, is in a position to meet 100% of demonstrated need, which means that there's some really great packages of free money yeah. uh, that families can take advantage of to help finance their son or daughter's education. No, that's that's excellent. Well, well, let's talk a little bit more about the school. I'm sure, you know, especially folks down here in Florida, they may not know of a school all the way up there in Maine. Uh, you know, Colby has a great academic reputation and I had a friend who went to Colby Sawyer, a completely different school, but, um, you know, give me some of the, the really neat things you found so far, Colby, maybe some of the stuff I wouldn't find just by clicking around the website. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of really special things about Colby. Um, just a little background because I'm from Dallas and I, I had never heard of the NESCACs as well um, until I moved up to the Boston area and, and was at Harvard coaching. And I heard about the NESCACs because they're referred to as the small Ivies. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what is that? What is the NESCAC? And so I was learning and learning about the school. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And then I ended up training a player um, privately who went to Amherst. And so I was learning more and more about, you know, the kind of kid that the NESCACs kind of drew in and, and uh, more about the league. And, and the more I learned, the more um, intrigued I was to, to try and be a part of that, thinking that it would be a great environment to kind of coach in. And so the NESCACs all, including Colby, are smaller schools, um, high academic schools. So we have about 2,000 students, um, very competitive to be admitted. And uh, the campus is gorgeous. It's one of the most beautiful campuses. You know, when people come visit, they're blown away. They, they can't believe um, how beautiful it is. And uh, it's in a really neat part of Maine where you have access to Sugarloaf Mountain, which is close by for skiing or snowboarding. There's lakes all over the place, uh, hiking trails all over the place. The beach isn't far away. And so you have all these really neat kind of outdoorsy things that you can partake in, you know, uh, around the campus and on the campus. Uh, there's over 100 organizations that you can belong to on campus. Um, so there's so many things that you can be a part of, um, which is kind of uh, really intriguing, I think. And I think the, the biggest thing that makes Colby so unique um, one of the biggest things is just the community. I mean, the community is very tight knit. It's very welcoming. It's very friendly. And I think people, when they come to campus, uh, they feel that and see that. And when I came on my interview, the players and everyone I met just absolutely love this place. And it, it, you can see it, you can feel it, you can hear it in their voice, how much they love being at Colby. And, and I really wanted a place that people love being at. And so I thought I could maybe be one of those people too, if I had the opportunity and it was offered to me. So I think the community is something it's, you know, the place is amazing. It's beautiful. It's, there's lots to do, but the people are really what make it, you know, really special and unique. So, um, you know, it's in a great league. Um, it's very competitive, you know, in terms of just the athletics um, we have an incredible athletic center that was just built a couple years ago, and it is the envy of <laughs> all other NESCAC schools and, and Division three schools and, and heck, maybe even Division one schools. I mean, it is absolutely incredible. 
And our, I know our student athletes love it. And, and certainly the coaches do as well. We have access to so many great um, facilities uh, through the, through the athletic center and, and it's a beautiful place to work. And so um, we're really lucky to kind of have had that added um, to an already great school. And then there's some things up and coming. We're building a fine arts center. Um, we are, we have a great art museum on campus that attracts a lot of people from all over. And then we're building an artificial intelligence center as well. And so there's, there's just a lot of things happening um, on the campus. And then uh, lastly, Colby has partnered really with the, with the city of Waterville to really be a part of continuing to have the downtown area grow and, um, you know, purchase properties down there and, and to continue to kind of revitalize the, the, the city uh, of Waterville. So um, there's nice partnerships between the, between the city and the college. Oh, that's great. Well, I know you say you got preseason start in a couple of weeks, but and, and this is your first uh, your first fall there, but can you walk me through what what you expect at least a typical week to be during the season in terms of you know when's practice, when's when are classes, when are kids eating, when are games? What what, what would a typical player have you know kind of that Sunday through Saturday uh, during the season? Yeah, I think you know during the season our kind of schedule of our players probably is very similar to. To probably anywhere. Um, we typically will play a weekend and a midweek game. Um, sometimes we'll play, you know, a Saturday, Sunday kind of back to back, a couple games there. I think that happens a few times in the season, but typically it's midweek and then on Saturdays. I know the NESCAC, you know, doesn't want you to miss class and are very strict on that. So that's kind of how they've scheduled that. And, and, um, and I think that's nice. I think it relieves a lot of stress for our players. Um, the men's team has decided to train in the morning. Uh, we've decided to train in the evening. And so our practice time will be anywhere from um, pretty much between four and five. Typically will be our start time. Um, it, we're going to try and kind of navigate that um, when our schedules are finalized. We kind of have a snapshot of what they are now and have picked practice times. But again, you know, the students might drop and add classes and that could change. So want to find a time where all or most can can make it um which is in the evening before dinner time and so for the most part you know the students will wake up they'll go to class do all the activities or study or do whatever they need to do through the day we'll train in the evening before dinner um they'll go to dinner probably straight from practice and then you know carry on with studying or doing their evening activities so um you know, it's, it's probably not different than most. Um, we certainly have a day off every week at the minimum, uh, which was required by the NCAA anyway, but we would have that regardless. And, you know, there'll be times that we'll, as we near the end of the season, we'll probably give them a couple days off a week and just try and rejuvenate them and make sure they're fresh going into that latter part of the, of the season. So, you know, I think our schedule is, is pretty common as with everyone. Um, we start a little bit later in the NESCAC and Division Three regarding preseason. And, you know, we hope to be playing into November and the end, the end of October and, and November, which means you're doing really well. Um, that's what our hope is. And, you know, after that, the players are, are ready to kind of go into the latter part of the fall semester and, and, and go home for Christmas and such. Um, in the spring, we don't really have the NESCACs really limit your ability to have an off season, um, it's voluntary. And really there's lifting times that the team will have. Um, but at this point, we're not allowed to train the team in an organized way with coaches present. And so it's all done, you know, through the, through the team and they organize it, they run it, they, um, you know, they, they pretty much are in charge of that in their own training. Uh, we did have, um, a season just like the other D3 schools have, because usually you have five weeks of three practices a week in the off season. That's the D3 rule, but the NESCACs are more restrictive because a lot of our students study abroad. And I think they want um, the students to feel like they have the freedom to pursue some more academic opportunities and, and such. And so we did have that as an exception last spring because of COVID, uh, but now it's returned back to the original rule. And, you know, that could change down the road. But as of now, 
it, it is um, that. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be player and, and student driven as far as their off season training um, kind of supplemented with time in the weight room that, that they can voluntarily go and meet with the strength coaches and get proper guidance in terms of lifting, making sure it's safe and, and a good technique and, and they're progressing in that way. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the team. Like, is there, is there a typical roster size that you're trying to hit every season? Well, again, I'm, I'm new. Um, our roster is slightly bigger um, than I'm used to. I think some, and I've looked at some of the rosters in other NESCAC schools and they're quite big too. So it's probably not as uncommon as, as I'm thinking of this. Um, and I think I'd probably want it maybe closer to 30-ish. We have about 35 or 34 now. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, but I'm used to more 28 to 30. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll get a good experience in terms of seeing what a roster that size is like. And, you know, maybe we'll stick with that. I don't know. It's kind of yet to be determined. But Don't worry. You're not, you're not the only one. Mo most of the coaches I've talked to are a little heavier than they would like just with COVID, with that extra year for kids and that kind of thing. So I think that's pretty common right now. You know, and I think what's nice about having a big roster is just more people get the opportunity. And I think that that's <clears throat> really important at the G3 level. And it's something that I, I like about that. You have more people get that experience of college soccer, which I think is really, really positive. And, and it really allows more people to grow in so many ways. Uh, but at the same time, kind of the, the other side of that is you want to be able to manage the players that you have and you want to make sure they all have a good experience and you're able to train them all and give them all the attention on and off the field that they need. And that's why I think maybe just slightly smaller might be good, but, you know, we'll try and, and uh, over time maybe get to that point. But to be honest with you, maybe I'll love it. I'll have a good experience this fall with a bigger roster. And, and the irony is, and probably the sad part too is, is that our roster is already slightly smaller due to some injuries, you know? And yeah. so, you know, typically you're going to get injuries through the season anyway. And so that's where the numbers, even if you have a roster that's large in terms of who's available to train each day, it might be um, just a smaller number just because of injuries and people that are in and out due to that. So, um, so we'll see, we'll see how it goes. And, and uh, see if we try and make our roster just slightly smaller over time um, or whether we stick with that number. So uh, kind of leaning on the roster uh, piece of it, what about your coaching roster? You know, you mentioned the strength and conditioning coach as well. What, what staff do you have uh, both just for soccer as well as kind of support staff that the athletic department gives the, the women's soccer team? Well, um, of course, we have a trainer, and he's wonderful. He's been with the team several, several years, uh, which is great. And then we have a, a really great strength coach um, that works with our team and, and really has done such a great job with them. And then I have a, a full-time assistant uh, who is wonderful as well. Um, she was here uh, the last year before I came, and uh, she's been awesome. Uh, the players really, really love her, and, and she's just been wonderful to work with and I think we complement each other pretty well and then we just brought on board um, a coach to train the goalkeepers for both the men's and women's team um, on a part-time basis and so he's got another full-time job in soccer but um, we're excited that um, both the men's and women's program can utilize his expertise and you know give that specialized attention to our goalkeepers and and that time that they need um, from a real expert. So I'm excited to bring him on and, and, and have our keepers exposed to him. That's awesome. So the last question I want to ask you about the team is, you know, this is your first season. What, what is your style of play going to be like? What's kind of your style of coaching that, that you bring to Colby, uh, in your first season? Well, um, yeah, I mean, you will see what system we'll play. I mean, um, I kind of like to teach a couple systems. You know, we might end up, based on our personnel, having one primary system and then one secondary system. Um, at Northeastern, we actually had kind of two primary systems. 
Um, we just had two that really fit our players really well. And we could kind of ebb and flow within a game and between games between the two. And I think that was kind of, that was kind of a huge strength of ours was to be flexible in that way and be able to provide some different looks. So, you know, we'll have to get to know our personnel, you know, I'm still learning the classes coming in and I wasn't able to see the players who were abroad. And so um, once we kind of get a picture of the personnel on our team and the qualities that they bring, we'll, we'll decide what system or, or plural systems that might fit us the best, but the style will be, you know, we hope the same, um, you know, possession oriented, but attacking style of trying to get behind teams in a variety of ways, uh, hopefully um, an exciting brand of soccer that creates chances and, and we'll work on that quite a bit, but we also will spend some time on, on some defending as well. I want to just be really tight defensively um, and super organized defensively. And so I'm excited to get in there and kind of see what our team is like and see what's going to fit us best. And, and um, you know, work on both sides of the ball with them. But but we hope, regardless of system, that you know it's a possession style, it's attacking oriented style, um, the attractive style to play that creates chances with really, really hopefully organized defending. Love it. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. You've been very generous with your time, so don't want to keep you much longer. Just have one last question, and that's what didn't we talk about? Uh, you know, anything else you want to talk about? Cover from the team to the school to, to the college process in general, uh, floor is yours. Yeah. I mean, I think we talked <laughs> those things. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you really, if I were to give advice to prospective student athletes, it's really to find your best fit. And I think people can get wrapped up in the things that are happening around them. Um, whether that's the student athlete or the parent, you know, people are committing and, you know, division one and blah, 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 and all these things. And I think it kind of clouds sometimes um, people's ability to really make decisions on what is the best true fit for them. Um, where are they going to succeed? Where are they going to be happy? Where are they going to play the role that they want to play? Um, where are they going to be happy off of the field, you know, academically and socially? And so I, I think it's really important for for the students, but also the parents to guide their son or daughter to find the best fit, not the name of the school, not this, not that, just the, the best fit. Um, you know, right now it's really the player's responsibility to kind of initiate all this contact and really take part in the recruiting process and email coaches. I will say that we get several emails a day, several emails a day. And so, um, you know, it's challenging to respond to all of them. I, I try and I do that, but, it, you know, there's other things that we have to do other than, than email um, with our team, with recruiting, with, you know, there's other responsibilities that we have. And so um, what I would say is from events or from prospect clinics, and this hopefully will help the families, is that if, if you went to an event if a coach is interested in you or sees that you would be a really good fit for their program, they will reach out to the student athlete. You know, um, if you're not hearing from a particular school, it might just be not that you're not good enough, but that you might not fit what they need and you might not be the fit, the qualities that they need at that time. And so that is feedback in and of itself. And that would allow the student to then focus on schools that, really could be good fits for them instead of maybe chasing schools that that maybe aren't you know whether that be from their standpoint or from the program standpoint so um you know it's it's tricky it's recruiting is you're recruiting 24 7 literally um every day every minute of every day practically um but i really want to make the student athletes and parents aware that um you know, there are other things that and responsibilities that the coaches have to do. And so to really pick their fit and spend time on coaches that feel like you're also a good fit for their program. I think that's uh, that's excellent advice and uh, something we try to reiterate here as much as possible. Um, so yeah. I really do appreciate that. Well, coach, wish you the best of luck in this first season and uh, hopefully you can uh, play deep into November uh, and and 
we really wish you the best of luck. If you ever get down to, to Bradenton for any of the tournaments at IMG or Premier, give me a shout. We'll go grab a cup of coffee. Okay. Thank All you right. So much. All right. Thank you. Okay.